what is Hochstein School of Music? Hochstein is a large community music and dance program um, that provides all sorts of activities. We have lessons, classes, four orchestras, two wind ensembles. We have small and large ensembles. We have early childhood music classes that start as early as age six months. We have theory classes. We have short classes um, for instruments like ukulele, mandolin, all different things like that that sort of fall under the Americana umbrella. Um, lots of adults as well as kids. Um, and the mission of the school is to provide opportunity for students of background regardless of their background and ability to pay. So we, because of that, we have a very large um, diverse community, both in terms of socioeconomic diversity, in terms of ethnic diversity and everything under the sun, and in terms of diversity of levels. I mean, we have beginners, we have very advanced students and everything in between. So, how and many, also, I left, off, I left off expressive arts, which is, um, you know, students with special needs working with uh, music, dance, and art therapists. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um, how many faculty members are at, I mean, I'm sure it varies from semester to semester, but just on average, how many faculty members are a part of Hochstein? And then how many students on average does, does Hochstein uh, have in a given year? Well, we, we have over 100 faculty in most cases. I would say right now of that number, probably close to 70 of them are individual lesson instructors um, that are you know, working with in the neighborhood of 900 students just for individual lessons alone. If we take into account everything that we do, including um, off-site work with expressive arts clients, there are probably over 1,100 even more expressive arts clients that are seen in group homes and all sorts of things like that. If we take in that and also all of the summer activity that we do, we, we really connect with over 3,500 students in any given year. So how are you going to handle that having that many students remotely having that many uh, as I as I talked about with uh, with Peggy's I know some things you can't do remotely or are really tough to do remotely but how are you going to manage that many students and faculty in a time when a lot of them just can't be in the building Well it's very tricky I mean we have I have to say I've been really thrilled that the individual lesson faculty you know we thought that those folks were the most likely to be able to continue with remote instruction. And I would say just about almost 100% have come back and have been willing to do that. And what I don't know is what the response has been from students. I'm only hearing about the good things, you know, the faculty members that are really set like me that I've been able to sort of connect with all, with all of my students and everybody's on board and willing to do that. I know not everybody has been as successful with um, reaching out to their families because, you know, families are, everybody's spinning right now. So they're, you know, if you're home with your kids home from school, they're worrying about other things and maybe lessons are not the first thing on their mind. So we're still assessing to see how many, how many people have actually said yes and they're willing to do this and how many um, are not willing to do it. And we're hoping if they don't do it, that they're willing to sort of hang with us until we can get back in the building and then see what happens because to be able to you know as you can imagine if we had to give massive amounts of credits and give refunds it would really be devastating financially for us and for our teachers so then going forward uh hold on i i got a I, I had like eight questions and they all just tried to come out at once and then none of them happened can uh, i mention one, yeah, one no. other thing no the individual lesson teachers aren't the only one i've been really surprised and thrilled that some of the, the class instructors have really been creative about trying to, to um, come up with other ways to do things. I know some of the fundamentals, which are our, um, our early childhood teachers have decided to come up with ways to basically create lessons for students and then they're going to send them out. They're not gonna be sort of live activities. A Couple of the chamber people are trying to write um, activities for their kids to do in the interim. I know the theory, the theory teacher is going to do some combination of remote and um, just assignment instruction. And even the, the two folks who are working with our bagpipe class 
which is a class of six people have, have worked out a way to give people individual instruction, pieces of individual instruction remotely to keep the class going. And our tap teacher, she's been teaching tap lessons from her kitchen. <laughs> Fantastic. So. Well, I, I won't, I won't uh, have you comment on any classes that you don't teach, but just from uh, a piano instructor's perspective, um, what, what is it like teaching live remote lessons? What, what, what is tough about it? What, what is easier about it if there, if there is anything about teaching remotely? Well, I have to th have to say that so far I've had maybe eight lessons so far, eight of my 18 this week, and I've been surprised that things have gone as well as they have. I was specifically worried about some of my more advanced students that the sound quality was not going to be great and then I would have some problems there, but it's really it's been good for the most part. And I've been using a mostly Skype and FaceTime, um, which has had Depending on the time of day, they have all worked. I mean, I had a lesson, just finished a lesson this morning, and it was the clearest one it had been. Hmm. Um, the one, some of the ones in the evening last last night were not as not as good, but I mean, the main challenge is it gets a little bit exhausting to try to um, go from one to the other. I think anybody that's got a large schedule, this just adds a little bit more difficult layer. If you have if you were to have 40 students like somebody like Kathy Kemp, mm. you know, going from one to the other, I think it's, it's more tiring. And I have, you know, I'm in the, I'm used to having a notebook with my students and writing down their assignments. So in some cases I've been having the kids write their assignments, which I think is good. And then in other cases I've been sort of spending, you know, another 10 minutes after the lesson, basically writing up notes for people and then sending them and you've got to be creative sometimes if they don't really see what I'm talking about or if I don't have a copy of the score that I'm working on right with them or I want to write something down, I'll take a quick picture. If we can't, or if I have the score and they can't tell what I'm talking about, I'll take a quick picture and then email or text it to them so they can see the spot I'm looking at. So it's just being creative to figure out things like that. Gotcha. I've actually had, I started this back in January because I had a student who went back to China with her mother for Chinese New Year. Mm. And they've been obviously unable to come back to into the country. So I, I started with her mm. back in January. So I've had a little bit of a learning curve with that one student. So it's been a little bit of a godsend for me that it wasn't sort of trial by fire like some of the others. How, how do you think Hochstein is going to be able to survive during this time? And how do you think Hochstein is going to do once this is all over? What I'm not asking you to give me any specifics or to prognosticate any spreadsheets but just just on your own gut yeah. feeling how do you think Hochstein is going to do the time when this is happening and then afterwards well i think the one thing that's been great about this is that we've always had a very close-knit faculty and staff and i think if nothing else this whole situation is going to bring everybody closer i think and it's it's stretching our capacity to do things that we might not have thought to do before um, the unknown is really the financial piece. You know, this is our 100th anniversary. So we've been talking all along about ways to sort of extend, expand our program and reach new um, parts of the population, some of the most marginalized that have not been able to come to our building and sort of looking forward to raising money to push the borders out a little bit in that way. And now, you know, with this situation, we're probably going to be in the in the case of just trying to see if we can recoup and and remain some sort of or keep some sort of normalcy so if we ended up having something that looked remotely like what we had before this happened that would be success hmm. i was going to say this probably isn't the way anyone wanted to celebrate hockstein's oh 100 years. no not at all nope yeah you know and we've had so many plans for different things throughout the years i think peggy might have told you that we had we were planning our largest um, gala fundraiser which was supposed to happen next week and that you know that's responsible in the past has been responsible for probably about 130 or 140 thousand dollars of the of the budget so now that has evaporated Jeez. so that plus the possibility of people not continuing and just not having revenue if we you know we can't pay teachers we don't 
the performance hall is closed down. So any events that had been there that were generating income for the school are not happening. So it's a, it's a perfect storm. Well, before I ask my last thing, um, would there be a way for people? I mean, obviously, you know, tuition and lessons are going to keep coming in, but is there going to, is there any way for people to just donate to Hochstein if they feel so inclined? Is, is that an option? Oh, of course. I mean, okay. we always accept donations. There's, there should be a donate bus, a button right on our, our website where people can easily donate to cool. our program. Sounds good. Uh, I asked Peggy how people can sign up for lessons. Uh, the, the, one of the prevailing memes going around is like, I can finally learn how to play guitar. So people, people, right. people, people, people will be able to do that. So I'll just end with a big picture question here, both you and I know how important music is to our, to our daily lives and how it affects, uh, it affects a city's cultural health and how important it is to people. But why is music, why is it important now more than ever to make sure that we're continuing to play music and find ways to, to share music. Why is that important more now? Well, I, for me, music has always been, at least in terms of teaching too, and performance has been about connecting with others. Music can be a very social activity. And I think it's interesting that here we are, you know, in this situation, we're doing all this remote instruction, but it really is to keep connected with other people. Mm. You know, we're all sort of stuck, stuck in our homes not able to go out for the most part. And it's just one more way that we can keep our connection going as human beings. And not to mention all the other benefits you'd normally think of music. I mean, music really does speak to an essential element, I think, in humanity. I mean, every human, I think, music speaks to our soul. And that's not gonna change, and it becomes even more important when, when people are isolated awesome. from one. Gary, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I, my, my plan is to get this out today. If it, that does happen, I'll send uh, everyone involved a link. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time, Gary. Appreciate it. Stay safe out there, okay? Bye-bye.